All right, we have a test next Friday. Exam three, today is Friday the 17th of April 2015. Exam three is next Friday. Friday for the in-class, the 24th. And for the online students, it's either gonna be Thursday or Friday with typical kinds of time options that I've given you in the past. So you want us to get started on thinking about that. I will post some old exams. I haven't started written, writing your exam yet. I hope to sometime today and at least send you a few possible types of problems. But um, probably I won't be able to finish it until Saturday or Sunday sometimes. We have something to celebrate here. Uh, Tyler Miller, who is one of your classmates, uh, we can focus on him here, right at the camera here. Tyler Miller, who is one of your classmates, um, along with Philip Gibbons and Ben Business, uh, had a great achievement. They were, they were outstanding winners in what's called the um, COMAP Mathematical Contest in Modeling. COMAP is the consortium um, for mathematics and its application within an organization, and every year they have a contest where thousands of entries from around the world enter, and they have two problems that can be chosen from, a problem A and a problem B, um, and Bethel University represented by that group was one of the five outstanding winners out of thousands of entries for problem B. This is a worldwide contest. What was problem B? We can glance at it quick just to see what it was. These are real world problems. Problem B is about searching for a lost plane, which is very much in the news in the past year. It says, recall that the lost Malaysian flight MH370, a little closer there, um, so that was in the news, build a generic mathematical model that can assist searchers in the planning and useful search for a lost plane that's crashed. Assume there are no, no signals from the down plane. You should recognize there are different types of planes that you might be searching for, different electronics and sensors. And they're supposed to uh, prepare a one to two page non-technical paper in addition to the regular paper for the airlines to use in the press, press conferences. So there's lots to do there. That's what they did. And Tyler, if I heard right, you did use some differential equations in your? Yeah, um, so a lot of what we did was we used Euler's method for partial differential equations to help track where debris would float after the crash due to ocean currents. Mm -hmm. We found data like um, at this point, you know, in whatever units they were, I forgot. Um, the ocean current will be going at this velocity in like the x direction and this direction and the y and this velocity in the y direction. Okay, so you have so, to think about real life flows rather than just purely, purely mathematical flows, huh? Yeah. So okay. then we use Euler's method to track where the debris would float and then also to track where a piece of debris came from once okay. you actually find it. Very cool. Thanks. Great to hear you guys did well. Problem A was about eradicating Ebola, so they did well. Uh, other teams tried that one, they didn't. They didn't do that one, but again, a very relevant problem. It's something that you can enter as well in the future if you want, if you're still here at Bethel. You can enter in and be a part of that contest. Bethel historically has had very good teams as well. The Bethel team has actually won outstanding winner five times since we started entering in 2001. There actually has been a common denominator in, I think, all of these entries, either as a student or a professor. That's Dr. Nathan Gossett. So um, he was a student back in 2001, 2002, I believe, when they won. And he's been a professor for recent entries since 2007. Okay, so let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Quite an achievement. Good job. All right, um, I'm going to be using Mathematica a lot today, more than usual. And we're also going to focus on the big picture. So the, in the past couple class periods, we've focused on a lot of calculations on the board involving complex numbers, complex exponentials. I want to summarize that and think about various kinds of graphs using Mathematica. So let's think big picture here. I can move the computer so it's easy for me to walk between here. So we're considering mainly these two cases. And we will once again consider just these two cases in class today. I think on uh, next Monday, I'll briefly mention sine of omega t case instead of cosine of omega t. 
So I'm going to have a, show you a bunch of mathematical code that's going to illustrate various things we've learned about. The first thing to illustrate is the beating phenomenon. That's the situation where it's this differential equation, this first one. What is that? That's a, that's a forced but undamped harmonic oscillator. There's no y prime term there. So we're assuming, for the sake of simplicity, that there's no friction, even though that's, <coughs> even though that's unrealistic. This function right here we saw was a unique solution of the initial value problem where y of 0 and y prime of 0 were both 0. So the mass is starting at its equilibrium position without any velocity, the velocity is 0, as you start to, say, tip the table back and forth and apply that external forcing. We're looking at the graph of that and we're noting, the main thing to note is that when omega and square root of q are close together, that's when the beating phenomenon is more pronounced. Here we have it. At the moment, square root of q is 3 and omega is 1, so they're not super close together, so you don't see a real pronounced beating phenomenon. However, if I increase omega, meaning increase the external frequency, if you imagine it as a table going back and forth, it's going back and forth faster. Increase omega, you see the beating phenomenon be more pronounced, like that. As omega is getting closer and closer to square root of 9, <coughs> omega is getting closer and closer to 3. When omega equals 3, well, that doesn't quite work with this formula because we'd be dividing by 0. So we're going to, if I change this to a 3, we'll get an error. Yep. 1 over 0 encountered errors. Okay, well, I could change it to 2.99, and technically that should work, but the graph, the beating phenomenon is very pronounced. The graph looks like it's blowing up. Actually, eventually, it would come back down again. So, that's pretty interesting. We can also find the frequency of both in the, in the periods of both the fast and slow oscillations. Visually, I'll focus on visually here with this particular value of Q and omega. Uh, looks like the period of the slow oscillations, looking like that, is close to 100. And the period of the fast oscillations, looking horizontally peak to peak here, it's hard to eyeball. Uh, is, see, this is 80, 60, 40, 20 there. You know, maybe about two or so for the period of the fast oscillations. You can use the formulas that I showed you the other day for finding those. Um, you can actually think of this as a superposition. What I have in this code is I'm graphing not just that solution, but also its pieces, so to speak. This function and this function in the same picture. So the purple one is the unique solution of the IVP. That's the purple one. What are the red and blue one? They're these functions individually, such that when I add those together, I get the, that unique solution with the beating phenomenon. These two functions are pure cosines um, with constant frequencies angular frequencies of omega there and square root of q there. So they don't change their frequency. They do change in amplitude. The thing to watch here to note is that when the purple graph, which is the sum of the red and blue graphs, isn't that clever? Purple is the sum of the red and blue. Uh, when, it's, when it's fairly large in amplitude, the red and the blue graphs are in phase, so to speak. They're close to being the same kinds of oscillations. They're close to each other. And then when the purple graph is small in amplitude, the red and blue are out of phase. Their peaks and valleys don't match. So they're kind of canceling each other out. That's the idea. So that's kind of a cool way to think about it. I'm allowing for an increase in R here as well to see this over a bigger interval but it illustrates the same thing. By the way, this has applications to sound waves. You can play sound waves with Mathematica. Yeah, better make sure the volume is done. 
Let's see if we can hear this. No, nope, can't hear it. Oh, I should have tested this out ahead of time. Your computer audio is pretty low too. Like, um, is it? Okay. I should have checked this out ahead of time. Um, it looks like the volume's turned on for it. There we have a sound wave that Mathematic is playing that's sort of a mixture of two different frequencies. I think it's 440 hertz and 550 hertz. I don't know where this 8,000 hertz comes from. Like, that seems like it's too, too fast to, to hear. It would be like a dog whistle or something. Um, I don't know why it says that there. Those are fairly far apart. You don't get a V phenomenon. But look at these frequencies, 440 and 441. Those are pretty close together. are adding together to give you a louder noise, and sometimes they are adding together to give you a, a softer noise based on where those peaks are lining up or not. How do other solutions of this differential equation behave? Let's see. It's not, it's, it's undamped, so the natural response, remember for undamped, doesn't decay away. No damping. The y h would not go to zero. So if I'm going to try to figure out how those two solutions behave, probably the most efficient thing to do is to use d-sol value. There it is. There is your unique solution of this generic IDP, where y zero is y zero, and the initial velocity is v zero. Kind of a complicated looking thing, but that's what it is. We can put that inside plot and see what it looks like. Do we get the beating phenomenon? Well, yeah, my initial conditions are zero and zero, which is the default here. But I'm allowing myself to change those. What if I change the initial y? Well, you don't always get beating. Sometimes the beating sort of switches like that. Isn't that cool? Sort of switches the phase of the beating, I guess. Initial velocity changes things as well. Looks like we're still getting meeting there. If I make y bigger though, do we get meeting still if I change the initial velocity? Well, sort of. It's not as pronounced, but it's still a sort of kind of meeting. What about if omega equals square root of q? That's called resonance. I replace the q there with omega squared. It's sort of simplest to think about it that way, so you don't have to worry about the square roots. What would a yc be if I then I thought about the complexified equation with e to the i omega t on the right hand side? I would guess the same thing as usual. Look at it here: a times e to the i omega t. What would happen if I plug that into the left hand side of the differential equation, which is what I'm doing here? Do you have a guess? when that's an omega squared instead of a cube? Do you have a guess? This is what's going to happen. If I plug this function in to the left-hand side of the differential equation, no guesses? You get zero. There's no way to make it equal the right-hand side of a complexified equation is what I'm thinking of in my head here. No way to make it equal e to the i omega t. It's because of the fact that q is omega squared. This kind of guess doesn't work. So what you do is you modify your guess, and you modify it in the similar kind of way that I talked about, oh, what was it, three class periods ago? Maybe, I forgot. With the repeated eigenvalue case. You multiply by an extra factor of t in there. It's just another guess. It's a guess that can ha that is fairly simple and happens to still work. Okay, this works. If you plug that function into the left-hand side of the differential equation and simplify, you get this, which can be made to equal 
the radian side of the complexified equation, e to the i omega t, you got an e to the i omega t there, as long as a is 1 over 2i <coughs> omega, right? Can you do that in your head? Set 2i a omega equal to 1, the coefficient of e to the i omega t, divide by 2i omega. In this resonant case, that'll work if A is 1 over 2i omega, which if you um, multiply the top and the bottom by the complex conjugate of the bottom, actually, I can just multiply by negative i, I don't have to do the complex conjugate, because I'd end up canceling the 2 omega anyway, gives you negative i over 2 omega, a purely imaginary A, in this case, That's going to make this work. You would take the real part, plug this back in here. I guess I might as well do it. Plug that back in here. Use Euler's formula. And take the real part of this for yp because the original equation had cosine omega t on the right hand side. Again, if we had a sine omega t, we take the imaginary part, and you should know that. You should be able to deal with that kind of thing on the test if I put a sine on the right hand side. What's the real part of this going to be? It's going to be come from this times this. Negative i times i is positive 1. The i's go away real part of this complex number is still the negative okay no the negative sides cancel so one over one over two omega sine omega t oops forgot my t t over two omega sine omega t which blows up as t goes to infinity it oscillates but those oscillations keep getting bigger and bigger I had a spot for a plot of this in here. I guess I don't. If you plot this, uh, t, t over 2 omega, let's pick omega to be 1. That's a function that oscillates with a bigger and bigger amplitude as t gets larger, and it never comes back down. It's, it's not beating. It's blowing up. If it were a sound wave, it's getting arbitrarily large in amplitude, which can't really happen in real life, but if it were a mass in a spring, it would start to oscillate so big in amplitude, the spring would break. Eventually, this wouldn't be valid anymore. All right, let's move on to the damped case. Damped force harmonic <coughs> oscillator. So now there's damping, friction. P is greater than zero. You got a y prime term in the equation, p times y prime. Here's your guess for yc. You plug it into the differential equation. yc double prime plus p times yc prime plus q times yc. That's the left hand side. Simplify it, set it equal to e to the i omega t. Solve for the value of a, that'll make it work. Again, I'm imagining in my head this is, I set this equal to e to the i omega t. Meaning I set everything but the e to the i omega t equal to, to 1. So a is 1 divided by this, also with that negative sign in there, which simplifies to this. I wrote this one down on the board, last class period. a, I'm putting the dependence on pq and omega in there, but you can just think of this as an a, is 1 over q minus omega squared plus i times p times omega. That's what we derived. Again, just <coughs> that's the same thing as one divided, one divided by this, also with the minus sign in front that can be distributed through the bottom. You'll get this. This can be written in terms of its real and imaginary parts if you do the trick of 
multiplying the top and the bottom by the complex conjugate at the, at the bottom. Complex expand, we'll do that in Mathematica. The real part of A comes from these two terms. They don't have an I. The real part is this minus this, which you could combine the two fractions into one and have just a Q minus omega squared on the top. Let's see, maybe if I do together, that might do that. No, went back to the original. Okay, so just do it in your mind. I actually did it right here. And the imaginary part is going to be the part next to the I, which includes this stuff without the I, but also includes the minus sign. That essentially, except for the minus sign, is down there. <coughs> Why did I get rid of the minus sign? These are going to be the coefficients of cosine and sine in YP. Remember, YP is going to be the real part of YC. Where YC is this, this A, which I'm just going to write on the board as alpha plus beta I, where alpha is this thing and beta is the negative of this thing. times e to the i omega t once again I forgot my r e symbol what's the real part of that going to be? it's going to be alpha times cosine omega t coming from first times first and also from last times last so you'll get a minus beta sine omega t, that'll be the real part of that product. The minus sign there cancels out the minus sign there. So that you get a positive thing here to be the coefficient of sine omega t. Make sense? So this thing, that's going to be YP. That is going to be a pure sinusoid. It's going to be an oscillation up and down with a constant amplitude. It's not a beating thing. But what is its amplitude and what is its phase? What kind of horizontal shift is going on with that function? Let's see that it certainly is a... sinusoidal wave, no matter what key, q, and omega are, change these things. Okay, I mean, yes, changing p, q, and omega does change its amplitude, but for any fixed p, q, and omega, the amplitude is constant. What is this again? It's yp. This is a damped case. Because it's damped, YH goes to zero as T goes to infinity. YH, the natural response, the general solution of the associated homogeneous equation, unforced equation, goes to zero. You're going to have exponential decay involved. Could go to zero in an oscillatory manner if the non-homogeneous equation or the homogeneous equation has complex eigenvalues. YH could go to zero in a purely exponential way if the unforced equation has real eigenvalues. So, yp is really the most important thing to get out of it if you're interested in just long-term behavior. Other solutions are going to approach this one as t goes to infinity. yp is the long-term behavior, the steady state behavior, so to speak. So it's not steady, it's not horizontal. As t gets larger when you have damage. What we want to do now is understand how the amplitude and the phase depend on p, q, and omega. 
I wrote this formula down in class last time. Capital A, what does that represent? It is the, the modulus of little a, absolute value of little a. Thinking of little a as alpha plus beta i. In general, it's a complex number when you've got damping. Its absolute value or modulus is the more official name, is the square root of alpha squared plus beta squared. A does equal 1 over B in our examples. Maybe I should have let B equal alpha plus beta i. Oh well. If you let B equal, okay, um, gamma plus delta i. This is the form that A takes for our problems here. You can also think of the modulus of A as 1 divided by the modulus of B, which is 1 divided by square root of gamma squared plus delta squared. And in fact, that's, that's what you're really seeing here. Capital A is that quantity. This is capital A. Sorry about all the different symbols. That thing is the gamma, q minus omega squared, and this thing, p times omega, is the delta. They're being squared. That's the most useful form of the amplitude in terms of p, q, and omega. And what people often do with this is they graph it as a function of omega for different p's and q's. No pun intended. Right, find your p's and q's. Isn't that how it goes? Mind your, no, mind your P's and Q's. Uh, so what do I have here? Well, on the right I have the graph of YP. On the left I have the graph of the amplitude as a function of omega for fixed P and Q. If I increase omega here, the graph on the left will move to the right. It will get traced out more. The graph on the right is a different yp for the different p, q, and omega, although omega is the only thing that's changing. Notice there is one value of omega on the left that's about 1.25, where the amplitude of the yp graph is greatest. Watch the, watch the amplitude. It's fairly small here. It's slightly bigger when omega is 1.25, then it gets smaller again in amplitude. If we're close to a resonant kind of situation, if p is small and omega is close to square root of q, then we can have a very large amplitude on the right, and the graph on the left has a peak. Make p even smaller, and the, and the amplitude of the graph has a peak that's very extreme. For omega close to square root of q, you've got a pretty big amplitude oscillation here. There's some damping, so it's not beating going on. And then as omega continues to increase, that amplitude too goes down. So we're looking at a bunch of graphs of yp for different omegas, and the graph on the left tells you where to expect the amplitude of the yp to be greatest. Also, I want you to notice something else here. When omega is small, relatively speaking, yp starts close to its peak at time zero. But when omega gets larger, look at that, now yp is starting close to its minimum at time zero. So something happens as omega gets larger, not just to the amplitude, but also to the phase of the graph on the right. When omega is small, it's close to the peak at time zero. When omega gets larger, it moves, it sort of shifts to the right so that it's close to the valley there, the minimum, at time zero. That's related to that phase angle. And remember the equation for the phase angle that I wrote last time was this. tangent of phi 
equals negative p omega over q minus omega squared. I believe was the way I wrote it. So, in a sense, phi is the arctangent of this. However, arctangent only gives you outputs between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Inverse tangent, if you prefer. And our phi is actually, we're going to think of as being in the third or fourth quadrant, typically. So, taking the arctangent of that doesn't quite work. There is a way to... I should also mention, like I, I should also mention something else. Like the amplitude capital A is the modulus of little a, which is its distance to the origin in the complex plane. And for us, little a is typically going to be down in the third or fourth quadrant. That's the modulus of a, but a also has an angle, and that happens to be phi. In a sense, the polar coordinates of a are the modulus of A and phi. I should also mention that because of that, you can use Euler's formula to write A in another, in another way, like that. That's another way to write A as, the, as its modulus times e to the i phi, where phi is its angle, and also called the argument. Now, the back it does have a, de a way to deal with this. A nice way to deal with this, what, I, what you might call the expanded arctangent function, where you use the arctangent function but with two inputs instead of one. Think of this as a point, x comma y. If you plug in the x and y coordinates of the given point, this is going to give you a, an angle for that point that's between not negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, but instead between negative pi and positive pi. It'll include angles in the second and third quadrants. That's kind of nice. That's what I'm doing here. I can take this to be the y and this to be the x for the situation. Y, uh, it's not quite the x and y coordinates of A. The x and y coordinates of A are this thing for its x coordinate, its first coordinate, its real part. And the opposite of this for its imaginary part, its y coordinate. However, you can get rid of those denominators and just focus on the numerators because the ratio of these two things, this divided by this, the denominators are going to cancel. And the point in the plane that has this is the first coordinate and the opposite of this is the second coordinate is on the same ray to the origin as the point with this is its x coordinate and this is its y coordinate. So I don't have to include those denominators when I do the our change of function here. I can just do this. What happens when you graph this? Hopefully you've seen these pictures in your book. If you've read ahead, section 4.4, should have seen these. You get this kind of graph. Once again, we still have yp on the right, and now on the left we have a graph of phi as a function of omega. When, when omega is small, Damping smaller, so the amplitude's bigger here. When phi is small, excuse me, omega is small, yp starts out close to its peak at time zero. The phase angle related to the horizontal shift is close to zero. As omega increases, watch both graphs. The phase angle graph goes down very rapidly, and the yp graph on the right goes with a shift to the right, in addition to other things happening, so that it's close to its minimum at time zero. 
essentially a half a period shift to the right. Just like the fact that this phase angle is getting close to negative pi is like half a rotation clockwise. 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 It's close to half a rotation clockwise around the circle. It is related to the fact that this is close to half a period shift to the right, going from the peak down to the valley. If you change P and Q, you affect the nature of the phase angle graph. If P, if you got a lot of damping, then the phase angle graph goes down fairly slowly, relatively speaking. And if you have a little damping, very not very much damping, then the phase angle graph is more extreme. Shifting that occurs is very rapid. What does this mean in real life? Omega, well, remember, is the, the angular frequency, so to speak, of the forcing function. The actual frequency is omega over 2 pi. It's telling you that if your omega is small, if your frequency of your forcing is fairly slow, your yp has peaks and valleys at the same locations of the peaks and valleys of your forcing function. You've got to be careful about which direction you think is positive and which is negative. But then if you increase the, the frequency of the forcing function, essentially they go out of phase. The mass on the spring and the shaking of the table go out of phase. The forcing is high and positive when the position of the mass is low and negative. Okay, so these are pretty interesting predictions. You'd have to confirm these with experiments to see if they're working. But these are pretty interesting predictions that the math is telling. What else do I want to mention here pretty quickly, even though it's kind of complicated? We might want to use d solve value to solve a generic initial value problem in the damped case. That's what I'm doing here. All, no, it's, excuse me, it's a particular initial value problem to keep it safe, simple. Although it's pretty complicated looking. If you enter this, you get this complicated stuff. It could be entered, and it could be a function that you plot. And the reason I did this was that I wanted to relate it to a mass on a spring. I actually made a mass on a spring. B is time. We can see the mass I'm moving up and down as time goes by. If omega is close to square root of Q, you're going to be close to residence, which is what it is here. Hmm. We're not seeing. Oh, because there's still some damping. Let's move that damping less pronounced. This is pretty close to a resonant type of situation you now. And the beating phenomenon would occur, but it looks like I, I'm not including enough time for that to come back down. Okay. But it was kind of fun. I made a mass on the spring. So I had a little fun with that. You also should be able to deal with converting this to a system of equations. The second order for scalar equation and it's second order because it involves a second derivative. It's, it's forced because you have a forcing function here. It's, it's also damped. I should have said that. Damped because P is there. It's positive. That can be converted to a first order system. Let D equal D, Y, D, T, and that becomes the first equation in your first order system, like always with these masses on the springs, these harmonic oscillators. And the D, V, D, T equation becomes this. And the forcing term, actually, I should have a positive sign there. Forcing term goes there, that should be a plus cosine of omega t. And in other words, what we have here is we have a non autonomous system. The right hand side doesn't just depend on little y and little b, doesn't just depend on capital Y, where capital Y is this vector right there. It also depends on time. We can separate out the time dependence if we want like this, but it is still dependent on time on the right-hand side. It's not autonomous. I guess here I use d-solve value to solve a generic initial value problem, and it's pretty nasty looking. Yikes. But that's the benefit of the computer here, and the benefit of mathematics, even though it's nasty, I can copy and paste this. 
crazy thing, to write a solution formula. I'm calling this the full solution, and I'm using a fee, making it reminiscent of flows. Am I going to get to a flow? Well, sort of. There's still nothing that's stopping me from defining a family of functions like this in the same way as before. Remember, when you think of these functions, you think of t is fixed, and y is the variable. Or in this case, little y and little b are variables. Although different t's, produce, different t's produce different functions, so it's a family of functions. It's got the same kind of formula, except with y and b instead of y0 and b0. Is the family a flow? Well, technically speaking, mathematicians have decided to not call this a flow. I suppose it still could model some actual fluid flows in thin sheets of water. But mathematicians treat this as a sort of a hard case because what happens is the flow property is not satisfied. This equation is no longer true when your right-hand side is not autonomous, when your system is not autonomous. Without getting into details, basically the upshot of that is solutions can cross without violating uniqueness. Big picture, I must have done large. There we've got a solution curve. It's crossing itself. That's hard to tell, actually. Let me change P and Q a bit so we can see this. There, OK, there it's definitely crossing itself. And that does not violate uniqueness, believe it or not. The, I don't know if you can tell this. I guess I'll change the B. Watch the vector field. The vector field itself is changing over time. It's not a constant vector field. That should make sense. The right hand side depends on time. Solution curves can, cro can cross themselves in such situations. They can also cross other solution curves. And it actually doesn't violate uniqueness. And the reason is it doesn't violate uniqueness is because to think about uniqueness in this kind of situation, you should really think three-dimensionally. This was something I mentioned like a month ago or something. You should imagine a t-axis coming straight out of the screen. In that extra third dimension, if you grab the solutions, not only as these curves, but let t change, so the curves kind of go like this. In that three-dimensional space, solution curves don't cross. And they don't touch, and, and solutions don't touch themselves, which should make sense because how is it, if t is increasing all the time, how is it ever going to come backwards? So it certainly is not going to cross itself. That's not a proof. It's not definitely not a proof that it doesn't cross other solutions, but it won't. So the upshot, again, is this can happen with non-autonomous equations and it does not violate the uniqueness theorem. So that is a very quick summary of a lot of stuff. Though it's stuff I've talked about, oh, I guess you can still imagine. Oh, this runs slow. I forgot about this. You can still imagine what happens to sets under this. This runs really slow, though, since the formula was so complicated. It actually aborted the calculation on my computer. I'm not sure if you're going to want to run that one. That's a very quick summary of a lot of stuff we talked about in chapter four. <clears throat> um, you know, you're going to want to experiment with this notebook and think about it some. These are concepts that I do want you to know. I want to end class today by starting chapter five a little bit. Um, next Monday, we will come back to chapter four a little bit more and then have more time for chapter five. In chapter five, we're going to uh, be discussing nonlinear systems as opposed to linear systems. For example, like competing species, cooperating species, and predator prey. Here's a predator prey model, a predator prey system. What's something I know how to do right away with this, even though I don't know how to solve it? I could certainly make the vector field. I could also make a stream plot to see what solutions look like. How would I make the stream plot? Well, the first thing that would go in the list that I'm plotting would be the right-hand side of the first equation. 
2r times 1 minus r over 3 minus r times f, and then put a comma, and then put the right-hand side of the second equation, negative 2f plus r times 4, r times f. r is supposed to represent rabbits, and f is supposed to represent foxes. So rabbits or foxes don't typically eat rabbits unless they're starving. Doesn't make sense to think about negative values for R and F, though I will include in my picture slightly negative values for R and F, like negative one. How big should I go? I'm not quite sure. Maybe up to six or seven or eight. Let's try eight. So we can certainly make the stream plot of this to see pretty quickly what solutions look like. There they are. Let's get rid of the frame. Caps lock. Frame, arrow false, axes, arrow true. <clears throat> All right, so this is the situation. This is the r axis, this is the f axis. And what do we see? We see, for example, that f in the absence of r, probably solutions are straight lines along that vertical axis and head towards zero exponential decay for the fox population in the absence of rabbits, which makes sense because if, F, if R is zero and this term goes away, you have a df dt equals negative 2f. The rabbit population satisfies some sort of logistic model in the absence of foxes and this term goes, goes away. And an equilibrium point would be at three. It's hard to see there, but these solutions are heading toward three. In the more interesting situation where there you have both rabbits and foxes, you're in the first quadrant and not in the axes, what are happening to solution curves? They are doing some sort of spiraling, it looks like, towards evidently some equilibrium point there. What are we going to do new, new now in Chapter 5? Well, we'll add null clients to this picture, for one thing, to help us draw it by hand better. For another thing, we'll find equilibrium points. I guess we've done that before in this kind of situation. For chapter two, we found equilibrium points still by solving systems of algebra equations. Something new in chapter five here, though, is we are going to use what's called linearization near equilibrium points. You know, it's a spiral sink. So are complex eigenvalues involved in some way? The answer is yes. However, you have to do what's called linearize first before you can find the complex eigenvalues. So somehow we're going to do this linearization thing that's going to allow us to use what we learned in chapter three to prove we've got a spiral source at that point, or spiral sink at that point. Okay? That's my brief intro to chapter five. See you on next Monday.